No, I won't do that. <laughs> Everyone can hear me pretty good if I speak in this volume, right? All right, sweet. Hi. Um, so, I'm Tom. I work at Basho. We make this database called Rioc. Uh Rioc is written in a functional programming language called Erlang, but we don't expect everyone to program in Erlang, so we write clients for them, one of which is in Ruby. And the whole goal of this talk tonight is to basically introduce to you some of the uh, basic concepts of React, how you, how you would actually use it, sort of like through Ruby colored glasses. Um, and then also talk a little bit of, uh, about some of the work that we've been doing to introduce some data types into it uh, called CRDTs. Uh, but before I do begin, I'm a little curious to see who here has actually heard of React before. Sweet. Keep your hand up if you use it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so come to the right place. I'm T. Santero, pretty much everywhere. Twitter, GitHub, at Bachelor.com if you want to email me if you do that. Uh, I'm on IRC as well. Um, and this is my Identicon on GitHub. Uh, so, Rioc, uh, like I said, it's a database. It's uh, open source, Apache 2 licensed. All of our uh, work that we do, all the development is in the open right on GitHub at github.com slash basho slash Rioc. Uh, it's very modular, so there's you know work in other repos as well, but uh, you'll get a feel for what's going on. In fact, uh, just recently we started uh, opening issues for future work that we're going to be uh, putting into uh, upcoming releases, uh, where we're looking for you know community feedback to see if you know what we're thinking about adding to the product makes sense or if it doesn't make sense and how it's going to affect you. Uh, and we also package it up. Uh, if you go to our documentation site docs.bash.com. Uh, you'll find uh, pre-compiled uh, packages for you know any distribution or yeah any Linux distribution, uh, Solaris, uh, SmartOS, uh, so basically servers. So what is React? React is a database, like I said, it's distributed as well as masterless. So if we were to think about this, all of the nodes that make up a React cluster. Uh, they all talk to each other. They exist sort of on a mesh network. So unlike maybe some other topologies for distributed data stores that you've worked with in the past, uh, this is one such that uh, we're doing peer-to-peer -peer replication and all the nodes uh, have knowledge of all of the other nodes in the system at any given time. It being masterless means you could actually talk to any node to serve any request, even if that particular server isn't responsible for the data that you're looking for. Um, so, in a lot of uh, standard configurations, you would probably just put a load balancer right in front of React <coughs> and not worry about which uh, nodes you're actually communicating to. Makes uh, the operational element of running React in production a little bit more simplistic in that sense. But uh, this top term that I have up here, distributed, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you would want to run your data store in a distributed nature. Uh, for the most part, it's typically to handle the types of concurrency and high write throughput, high read throughput, uh, that you can't get without a little bit of pain uh, with your standard relational databases, your MySQLs, your Postgres sub the world. But I'm not here to suggest that just because there are new data storage technologies that do exist today uh, and try to address some of these pains, I'm not suggesting that uh, relational databases uh, aren't good. In fact, they're actually very good and they give us a lot of good things. But so like, let's say we're to just you know, download one of the packages, it's just a Debian package. Uh, we install it on all of our servers um, and basically repeat it uh, on every single server. Building a cluster of React is dead simple. On every single node, you just run this command, react admin cluster join, and then you provide it with uh, the name and either a fully qualified domain name or an IP address of another node that's supposed to exist in the server. Once you're done doing all of that, on any node, you can just run React Admin Cluster Plan, and basically you're going to get this uh, readout of what uh, what your cluster topology is going to look like uh, once everything uh, once you actually build this cluster. So in this particular example, I've got one node uh, that is the entire database, and I'm adding four nodes to it uh, such that the uh, each each of these five nodes are going to have an equal share of uh, the data, uh, and this is pretty important because. Uh, with React, we've designed it such that you can have uh, you know, as close to predictable performance and latency curves as possible 
by achieving, uh, by basically destroying data locality and spreading it as evenly as possible across all of these nodes. So again, as I mentioned earlier, by putting a load balancer right in front of it, uh, you're, you could essentially just round robin every node for every new incoming request. It's going to go to some random node, and that way the cluster's overall health is essentially going to have uh, this very flat, very predictable uh, performance curve. And it's going to really allow you to know exactly what your regular operating thresholds are, uh, or regular operating levels are, and what your uh, upward bound thresholds uh, should be, such that if you experience any sort of peak load at any given time, or unexpected traffic, or you know, if you're a startup and you get that hockey stick that everyone's looking for, uh, you can plan accordingly and plan ahead to scale this thing out. So just to sort of visualize it again, React cluster, a uh, whole bunch of nodes, um, that's that. So let's talk about Ruby. The Ruby client is developed uh, at this repo, react-ruby.client in the Bash organization. And you can install it very simply with, uh, uh, it's a gem, so gem install react-client. So how would we actually start talking to React? Um, if you, you, you want to build a, a connection with a client object, uh, so you call react-client.new, and essentially that's going to uh, assume a couple of different defaults. Uh, it's going to have a default uh, IP address of just localhost. It's going to have default ports, and it's going to have default transport port protocols. Uh, but you could run client.main to see if uh, you actually made that connection. Uh, and if it returns true, then you're actually connected. Uh, you've established an, a connection to uh, React. But in case you don't want to use a load balancer like HA proxy or NGX or anything like that, uh, we could actually you could actually specify uh, a list of nodes to connect to, uh, providing host names, pro providing specialized ports. You could change the port in your configuration files on your React nodes. Uh, such that you're not using the standard defaults, uh, a little bit of a security measure, uh, whatever you want to do. It's pretty straightforward. So React is a key value database. In the entire database landscape, key value is the most simple way that you can think about organizing your data. You have something and you want to access it, you want to address it, so you give it basically a key, a name. Um, so an object is what we call a key value pair uh, in React. And this is going to be what we like to think of as a fundamental unit of replication. So in most distributed data stores, when we're dealing with multiple <laughs> servers, we're going to be saving multiple copies of the things that we're storing into the, um, into the database, such that if we have some sort of failure event or uh, intermittent timeouts on any particular nodes, it's not going to sacrifice the overall availability construct uh, or uh, you know, it's not going to sacrifice overall availability. We'll have other nodes that we're able to go to so in React, we've got a key, a value, and then a little bit of metadata that's attached to uh, this object, and that's the uh, object as a whole. So we also namespace our keys into uh, these things called buckets. So you know, unlike uh, if you're familiar with S3 uh, or something along those lines, this term bucket is probably poorly chosen in retrospect. Uh, it has nothing to do with data locality. Like I said, we completely destroyed that in React for, uh, for sanity. Uh, but uh, these buckets are important. Essentially, uh, they give us the opportunity to reason about the various different types of data that we might be storing into the database, and such uh, we could logically separate uh, subsets of our data. And our buckets themselves uh, can hold different characteristics according to the different objects that we store into them, such that anytime I store object A into bucket 1, it's going to inherit all of those characteristics of bucket one. If I store object A into bucket two, it's going to inherit a whole bunch of different characteristics. And I'll touch on that in just a second. So uh, if you were to actually uh, do a, 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 key, a key lookup in React, you would simply supply the bucket name and then the key name, and that's the way that we would address the object. So essentially, a bucket's just prepended to the key. So if we wanted to um, do anything in React, once we have our established connection, uh, again, that's on the object that we just cl uh, called client. Uh, you know, I could create, oh my god, bucket. And uh, I have two ways of actually doing this in the React client. Uh, I could do it client.bucket and provide the name of the bucket that I'm looking for. and uh, Or I could do it a little bit more like a hash and just uh, supply it like that. So it doesn't necessarily matter if the bucket exists or not. Theoretically, any bucket name that you would ever throw at React uh, will exist. Once you start storing something into it, 
uh, it's always going to uh, be there. And so long as we don't modify the default properties, uh, it, doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't cost any space to have multiple buckets. But what are some of these properties that I'm talking about? So if we were to look at the bucket properties uh, by passing the dot props uh, method to this uh, bucket that I called me out here, uh, we'd actually uh, see that there's a whole bunch of different things that we could actually configure. Not all of these are exactly uh, glaringly important, and we don't really need to go over all of those. But some of them that I do want to point out is this nval uh, pr, pw, r, rw, um, and allow mult right here at the top, you know, which is uh, defaulted to false. So what are these? They are quorum values. So the end value specifically is our replication factor. And this is completely tunable. So by default in React, this is three, such that any time I'm going to store an object, I want three copies of it. So where do these R and W values come into play? Well, these will be the number of servers that have to respond to any given request for any object in order for us to acknowledge that request as being successful. So by default, R and W are uh, defaulted to two in React. So with a replication factor of three, the anatomy of a request, a uh, very basic request to React will come in. Let's say we're looking to read an object. You hit any node in the server, like I mentioned. It's going to uh, basically take the bucket key, decide which servers that uh, this, these replicas live on, and it's going to then broadcast three asynchronous messages out to each one of these replicas to uh, say, give me this object. Uh, we have a request coming in. So with an R value equal, equal to two, the first two of these nodes that actually respond are going to allow us to uh, have a successful request and uh, we could acknowledge that to the client with the payload, which will be the value that we're looking for. Is that pretty straight? Sweet. Same thing for, w, for uh, w value, uh, except it's on our right. We've got these other uh, tunable parameters, parameters uh, PR, PW. Um, basically, when you write something to React, uh, it's going to write to uh, primary replica, uh, primary partition, basically, in the total key space. It's not really necessary to, uh, you know, go into uh, the total distribution of the key space at this time, I don't think. But uh, let's say that we have some nodes that are down at any given time, because, you know, hardware, it always stays up, right? Um, we could specify the number of primary nodes that need to uh, participate in our requests, just like with our regular W and, uh, and R values. Uh, so in the event of an unavailability event, uh, React is just going to automatically elect secondaries. Uh, and this is a way that you could say that I don't want any secondaries or to limit the number of secondaries that might participate in any request. And DW is a durable write form, and that's essentially the number of nodes that have to respond back in any write operation uh, once those bits have actually been persisted to disk. As, uh, aside from, you know, like in many other data stores where, you know, you get your acknowledgement back when the object's just in memory and waiting to be absent down the disk. So, uh, you know, durability will help you with the sanity of knowing that your object's actually there, just in case maybe you got an acknowledgement back that the write was successful, and then the power went out, you know. Uh, you have no idea if your data's still there or not. So. If we wanted to change some of these bucket properties, uh, we could just call uh, our uh, bucket with you know, client, meow is our bucket here, and just specify those uh, values specifically uh, as seen. It's pretty straightforward. So let's, uh, let's look at some of our primary key operations. It's a key value store, and we do have uh, functionality for secondary indexing and full text search, uh, but I figure just for tonight, we'll stick to the key value uh, bits of React, especially since when you're running React in production and especially at scale, uh, the performance of your cluster is going to be much more predictable the more you use it like a key value store. And you'd be surprised with, after sitting down for a little while and thinking about your data model, how much of your data can actually fit to a key value model that, uh, that you didn't actually realize. So, Line number two here, uh, let's see uh, if a key, uh, an object with the key, my key, actually exists in my bucket. Uh, if it returns false, it clearly doesn't exist. So I could uh, actually call a method getter new uh, to my key and 
and it's going to create a Ruby object uh, that is a React object. Uh, and it's going to have, uh, by default, uh, its content type is going to be JSON. And it's going to have nothing as its value. So uh, if I wanted to store anything, I would just uh, take that object that I just created uh, and hit it with dot data and provide something. So in this particular uh, example, I gave it a list of strings. And I could call store. And if I were to get the object by just uh, supplying, you know, the hash of bucket key here, uh, I would see that, uh, you know, it actually did get stored there. We could uh, work with a little bit more complex objects that we might be a little bit more familiar with in our uh, uh, in our Ruby applications. So I've uh, just created this object, uh, Atlanta Ruby Users Group, and basically, you know, title of this talk, speaker me, the link to this meetup page, and the date. Uh, which is, you know, today's date. And essentially what I do is um, basically calling a new meetup bucket here, uh, and I want to create a new object with the key being the date from this object here, which is uh, I've passed on here in uh, line 11. Uh, and then uh, the data is the total object itself, and when I call store, it's automatically going to be encoded, encoded and serialized into React as a JSON object. But let's say you guys don't like this talk and we want to get rid of this object. Uh, we could just call it back here uh, and then just pass uh, delete to it. And then if we were to check to see if it exists again, we'll get false. Pretty straightforward. So if you guys don't like this, we'll delete this talk. But React's, uh, uh, React's objects, they don't have to be JSON. They don't have to be any sort of structured or semi-structured document or anything. They're completely opaque. You can store whatever you want. There's a couple of caveats. You don't want your object size to really grow beyond three to four megs. And that's simply because the network uh, traffic, intra network, uh, intra cluster network traffic uh, will become too chatty and it's going to disrupt your nice stable performance profile that you know we love React for so much. Uh, so you know, keep an eye on that. But let's say you know I've got this uh, JPEG of a kid on my desktop. Uh, I could you know uh, store it into an images bucket with kitty.jpg as its key. Uh, and then if I were to actually go to call it, I would get my kitty back. And I actually did this earlier on a live production React cluster that I do run, so now like there's an image of a cat in that cluster. So, <laughs> so that's uh, that's pretty much uh, React straightforward. Um, and it's very simple to reason about. It gets a little bit more complicated when you've got uh, when you're used to your relational model and uh, you're doing either complex joins to build your views or you're not sure exactly what the da data is that you've stored into React. Um, and it will take you a little bit of time to start to reason about how you can start building applications uh, that fit uh, this model specifically. But I guess the rule of thumb is, if you're coming from a relational world, uh, you just want to persist the data that you would want to be the end view from, uh, from your relational query at the end of the day. So um, with that, uh, let's talk about objects that are a little bit more interesting. So, raise your hand if you've heard of CRDTs before. Sweet. All right. So CRDTs get me really excited. CRDTs uh, stands for Conflict-Free Replicated Data Types. So we're in a distributed data store. Uh, all of our objects <coughs> are replicated. Uh, React is something that we call an eventually consistent data store. So uh, when I write an object uh, to a particular key in React, there's no locking that happens. There's nothing that's going to uh, prevent some other user, or some other application, writing to that object at the same time as well. So um, I'm going to do a little bit of crowd participation here. Let's see how this goes. OK. So you, you, and you. Uh, you guys are my nodes that are responsible for persisting just one object. OK. So everyone else in the room, I want you to think of a number between 1 and 50. OK. Now, when I say go, I'm going to count down from three. When I say go, everyone shout that number to these guys, and they're basically going to be the nodes that are persisting in. All right? Everyone got your numbers? One, two, three, go. Yeah. Seven. What's the value, guys? Seven, six, nine, seven, six, nine, six. <laughs> so, essentially, to make it a little bit more simple to look like, this is what just happened. You know, when we when we store objects into React, you know, we actually apply this method called consistent hashing, where we take the bucket key pair and we apply a hashing algorithm to it, a SHA-1, and it turns it into an integer that maps to a divided integer key space, and that allows us to determine which nodes 
uh, who take uh, ownership of slices of this uh, total key space allows us to know which nodes actually get that uh, replica. So in this particular example, these three nodes are responsible for you know, whatever object that we're looking to store. So in the event of a concurrent uh, update, we've got, uh, in an eventually consistent database, we've got basically two options that we could take. We could do last rank wins, and the last one, uh, last object that makes it there, according to a wall plot uh, timestamp, uh, that's the canonical value. That's not good if you care about your data, because essentially what you're saying is, I'm throwing away data that might be important, and just because there might be some sort of uh, network congestion or latency across the network, and networks, as we all know, are inherently asynchronous, we can't reason about the ordering of when my packets are gonna get across uh, copper wires, uh, this could be bad. So the other option that we have is to basically just keep both or all of the values. But that creates what we call in React a conflict. Uh, so conflicts are essentially when you have one object, uh, but it has multiple values. And we call those, uh, when, once you update those objects and they end up having multiple values, uh, we call those siblings. So if you were to think of it as sort of like a graph where you have a parent, uh, the next uh, object, instead of it being, uh, you know, a single object, it would be split, and we have to resolve that conflict somehow. So we express, uh, we expose uh, ways for React to show you when you have conflicts and when you have siblings in the database, uh, but that leaves it up to you, the programmer, and maybe even sometimes uh, up to the user of the application to resolve that conflict, depending on what sort of data you're storing and what sort of uh, logistics uh, have to be applied to the situation to decide which value should be the canonical value. So without having to worry about semantic resolution, there's this whole body of research called conflict-free replicated data types uh, that allow us to avoid having to resolve these conflicts uh, um, semantically and, uh, and still embrace the eventual consistent, the goodness that we get from eventual consistency. You know, the goodness is, you know, really strong liveness, uh, ability to handle concurrency, loose coordination things that make uh, applications that are able to run with virtually no downtime so long as your hardware doesn't crash. So the C in CRDTs, uh, like I mentioned earlier, stood for conflict-free, but there's actually two types of uh, CRDTs that exist out there in the wild. And essentially they're convergent or commutative. So convergent uh, replicated data types are data types where their inner working logic uh, is uh, state-based where we uh, eventually, where essentially you write state to the data uh, types themselves, uh, and then there's some sort of logic uh, that is applied to, uh, uh, applied such that we could converge values, so basically a merge operation uh, in a lot of cases, uh, and eventually uh, get a consistent view of what we're looking for. Then there's commutative, uh, which are operation-based, so the Easiest example of something that's commutative that we all know and love is something like addition. So if I were to say, what's the value of 3 plus 1, everyone here will say 4. If I say, what's the value of 1 plus 3, everyone here will say 4. So the order of that operation, the order of the events happening, adding uh, one, and four to get, 1 and 3 together to get 4, it doesn't matter which order they actually come into. So operation-based uh, replicated data, data types or commutative-based uh, replicated data types uh, are you know, clearly uh, going to be an easy way that we could reason about uh, conflicting rights to the same object. So, and again, uh, because there's these two different types, most people just refer to them these days as conflict-free. There's this research paper, just as an aside, if you all, after this talk, are much more interested in learning more about CRDTs uh, and how you could use them, there's a research paper by um, Mark Shapiro and uh, a number of other academics from this university in France called INRIA, and it's only about 50 pages of advanced math, so uh, not to be frightened. But basically it's going to detail all the various different types of CRDTs, how they work, and then have uh, their formal proofs of why they actually do work. So it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So we've implemented CRDT server-side here in REAC. Um, I should note before I go into this, uh, CRDTs, this paper from InRare, it was published in 2009, it's relatively new in uh, research, and between 2009 and 2012, there are a lot of people, uh, not too many, uh, that got really excited about CRDTs and what they could bring to you. So, since this is a Ruby crowd, um, there's an 
engineer named Kyle Kingsbury, who actually wrote a, a Ruby library called Mean Girls, M-E-A-N-G-I-R-L-S. Um, he's Afer online, A-P-H-Y-R. So if you go to GitHub slash Afer slash Mean Girls, you've got yourself a Ruby CRDT library that's almost uh, complete with all the various different counters and sets and registers and all the different types of CRDTs available. So if you want to experiment with them. And if you're wondering about the uh, title of the uh, of the library Mean Girls, it actually comes from the movie Mean Girls. Apparently there's a scene where there's, all the girls are like talking to each other and basically it's a game of telephone and essentially the, the message gets scrambled at the end. So like that's sort of like, I guess, the inspiration what Kyle was thinking about. Is if you think about it, it's sort of like, you know, what a CRPT is supposed to handle. So, all right. So in React, we wanted to expose these uh, server side, so you wouldn't have to worry about implementing them on, on the client. Uh, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, there's a lot of things that you end up having to garbage collect, and you know you want to be able to uh, build them such that these are data types that could transparently survive things like node failures and complete network partitions, and still give you an eventually consistent view of what the object's value should be. So. Uh, we've implemented counters thus far, and uh, in our most recent release of React, React 1.4, which came out a few weeks ago, uh, we give you one of these uh, counters, and our next release of React is going to happen sometime later in the fall, and we've already got prototyped uh, a few other types, which I'll talk about at the end. So, there's this uh, type of counter as a CRDT called a G counter, or a row only counter. Can anyone guess what it does? You can only increment it. Yes, exactly. So it's monotonically increasing. Uh, for those of you who don't like my academic terms, uh, something that's monotonic uh, means you can only add facts. You can never refute facts. So uh, a G counter, uh, a grow only counter, something that's monotonically increasing means that uh, I could only continue to keep adding new information. And the new information that I would be adding to a data type like a counter is somebody that wants to add a value and the value that they want to add. So uh, by it being monotonically increasing, uh, we have uh, logic that we could then reason about such that the value is never going to miss an update. So this is uh, a convergent uh, or state-based type of CRDT. Um, and basically, like I just mentioned, I preempted my slide, uh, it takes an actor ID uh, of essentially which node is saying increment and the value of how much it should increment. So let's look at uh, an example. So uh, A, B, and C here all correspond to a replica that's supposed to represent the same object, some same count. So the total count right now is 21. Now the way this actually works is that each replica that consists of this particular object, they keep, a, they keep track of what uh, they think the value is for each of the different replicas. So value A for here it, on A means replica A knows for certain that it's getting uh, an increment of 4. And it thinks that B is getting an increment of 7 and C getting an increment of 10 and so on and so forth for uh, B and C uh, respectfully. So if we were to have some sort of update, uh, an increment operation happen to our G counters here, uh, we could have A uh, wanting to add 5 to the total value, and concurrently uh, have B adding 8 to the total value, uh, but this 5 operation is not seen on, uh, on B. Simultaneously, uh, this 8 operation is not seen on A, and C doesn't see anything. But what we actually do is, after you uh, uh, send these increment operations, you just do a merge of all of the total values. So since each node is only uh, really responsible for uh, keeping track for what uh, its count is, what we're, uh, and a loose attempt to uh, keep track of uh, all of the others, what we could then do is just take the highest from each, and it's going to give us our accurate count. So even if other replicas don't see the operation, we know that at least one of them did. Uh, and if we were to apply a merge function to this, we're going to have our accurate count of uh, getting uh, 8 from B and 5 from A, and our new total is 23. So this is actually, um, oh, and it works, yay. <laughs> um, so this is uh, really good for uh, counting things that are uh, not really too important. Like, I wouldn't count your inventory with this. Uh, you can implement something like a Facebook like button where if the count is not completely accurate all the time, uh, it's fine. So why am I actually saying this? So when you actually do a merge operation by default, uh, merge, uh, when, anytime that you merge uh, two values, 
it's a non-item potent uh, operation. So basically, uh, you won't if you were to try to merge again and uh, and values have changed, it's going to change the results. So something that's item potent is a function that I could apply to something where uh, I could apply it uh, n times, and the value is always going to be the same. You know, uh, so. Uh, that's uh, that's not uh, really good. So, like, basically, what I mean is, you know, in React, if you were to basically try to increment a grow only counter, uh, and the operation failed, it failed to meet those quorums. Uh, if if our you know replication factor was three and our uh, right value was like let's say two or so, and two of those nodes weren't available to respond, that doesn't necessarily mean that that one didn't get uh, uh, that one of these uh, increment operations didn't get through. Uh, to one of the replicas. So when we go to merge, uh, we're actually going to be adding that in the in the final count. So it gives a uh, it, it gives you something that's a little bit difficult. But uh, one of the other reasons why this makes me sad is that we can't ever reduce the value. We can't decrement. So you know, what's, what what good's a counter that we can only add? So hey, there's a PN counter, uh, and this is what we've actually implemented in React. So a PN counter is really really straightforward. It's just two grow only counters, one that's uh, responsible for tracking additions and one that's uh, responsible for tracking subtraction, uh, tracking subtractions. And the value of our PN counter is basically the difference of the two. So, like I mentioned earlier, there are other types of CRDTs, sets, registers, and maps. Uh, sets are specifically cool because you've got this, uh, you've got all kinds of ways that you can then uh, not have to work with just integers. You can deal with strings and a whole bunch of other things. And uh, there's this data type called an OR set that's already sort of like on a branch and stage for the next release, like I said. And we're hoping to have pretty much as many data types as possible, but all of the really useful ones available in our next release. Um, but you know, CRDTs means that there's no more conflicts uh, for our eventually consistent replicas. So thank you. And any questions? You didn't show us how do you resolve conflicts for sets or maps. It's slightly more complicated than. So uh, you don't have to. That's the thing. Uh, by having it server side, uh, we resolve the conflicts itself. So like essentially, like the way that we implement like a PN counter is uh, we create a sibling every time that you do an increment operation, and uh, on that put operation. Uh, once we res respond back that the put's been successful, there's a, under the hood, there's a merge function and a callback that then does the merge uh, and then will return. You can specify that you want the value returned to you uh, as, uh, as your acknowledgement of the request, or you don't even have to have the, the value returned if you don't want. Uh, but that's basically how uh, it, it converges to what the value is supposed to be. Yes? So you gave the example that you're using this counter, and you try to write the value, and only well, not enough nodes respond and say, "Yep, I got it." And you said, in this case, then whatever when it merges, you end up with the right value. Mm -hmm. In the normal case of React, does it inform you that this operation has failed? Like, how do you? Yes. How like how are you aware that? Well, it kind of worked well enough that as long as the power doesn't go out, we're okay. So. I made a mistake when I said that, thinking that I was at the bar and I had two hours to talk about CRDTs, all I wanted. And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have said anything uh, to that effect, simply because it's probably a little bit more confusing than need be. Uh, but I'll answer the question anyway. So in React, whether we're dealing with CRDTs or just regular key value operations, if your object uh, that you're looking to write, whether it's a new object or an update, doesn't matter, if you fail to meet the quorums, all that means is you fail to meet the quorums, and it responds back as uh, a failed operation to the client, right? So typically, you're probably in your, uh, you would have exception handling where you would just retry uh, when you caught that exception, except uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that because you failed the quorums, the object didn't get written to at least one node, right? So plain vanilla React has anti-entropy features, which is just a fancy term for self-healing. And basically, uh, any time that you go to read an object where there's divergent or stale or missing data, at read time, it's going to automatically repair replicas that have uh, stale or missing or divergent data. We also have active anti-entropy, which you don't have to be doing.
doing a read operation just in a background process. The cluster itself is just going to completely self-heal. It's actually really cool, too, uh, to have a self-healing cluster because it's, it has nothing to do with eventual consistency, but rather uh, a durability aspect of databases where you can have something like bit rot or corrupted uh, disk sectors on disk. And, you know, you want, uh, and React's going to, you know, update those as well, you know, so, you know, if there's a case where perhaps you don't read a replica for a really long time and you have corrupted disk, uh, hit, you know, hitting all of your nodes, eventually you could, like, lose data simply because you didn't read it and it didn't get repaired. So, um, so yeah, because of read repair and active anti-entropy, uh, you know, that uh, value might propagate eventually. Um, and in the case of a CRDT specifically, uh, like I said, the counter operations, uh, like a merge, a merge function itself is non Uh But once we introduce uh, something uh, like the OR set for, uh, specifically, the value that you could be storing in the OR set could be an integer itself. And an OR set is actually, um, uh, you, you can merge. So like it, it's a set. It's like you basically store a tuple. Uh, and the actor ID from uh, the set, uh, or from the operation that you're inserting into the set, uh, could also include a timestamp such that if, or it doesn't include a timestamp, it, it includes like basically a, uh, a function ID of like who's doing this increment. So if you get a fail with an OR set uh, increment operation, you can just retry it. And when you actually go to converge, it's going to throw away duplicates. Uh, so like then you, an OR set will essentially be item and you can reason about like having a uh, eventually consistent, but like, uh, but you know, safe count <coughs> in that in that case. Okay. Did that answer your question? Did it? Yeah. I think basically the answer is it'll tell you it's an error, but it might have worked anyway. Exactly. Uh, and that's something that you have to keep in mind when you're building sure. your application. It's not the end of the world, but you know, it's just gotta unexpected know that, behavior. Just gotta know that it, you know it's doing that. In in days. I would, yeah. I would expect the database to say you might fail, you might not fail. Yeah. But I mean, that's just not the contract. Of yeah, exactly. So, like that, when the database says I failed and it failed, you know, like that would be like a in a transaction with asset guarantees, you know, and you know, basically there's it's there's no all or nothing. There's no atomic property to a React operation. Mm. Yes. Um. Your the three hash routing reminded me of Bloom filters. Are the cons eventual consistency is it probabilistic or deterministic? So, on which side of the operation? Like because. Well, you've said several things that made me think about this. One, the routing reminds me of how you set bits in a Bloom filter. Mm -hmm. um, and the uh, mention about the likes or not wanting to count things that need to be exact made me wonder whether or not it's actually a probabilistic like uh, voting counting algorithm. And I was yeah. curious about that. So there's a couple of different things in that question. So routing of the requests uh, on any operation, a get or a put in React, is deterministic because they're always going to be going to the same what we call a vNode, a virtual node, okay. which is basically a process that supervises a slice of the total key space. So we've, it's a distributed hash table, essentially, React. And if you were to uh, take a total key space of a SHA-1, so 2 to 160, mm -hmm. and if you were to envision that basically in a circle, wrap it in a ring, starts at 0, you walk it clockwise, and you get to 2 to 160, and then you keep going, you're back at 0. Right. Uh, you slice that up into, you tokenize it uh, into a bunch of evenly sized uh, and a fixed number of evenly sized partitions. Uh, the nodes that make up your cluster of physical nodes, they're going to randomly, uh, well not randomly, they're going to algorithmically claim responsibility for various slices of these uh, uh, various tokens, right? So when you actually do any sort of get or put operation, uh, it applies a consistent hash, uh, so that we have now an integer that will map to this key space, and it's always, that operation is always going to go to those V nodes okay. uh, that uh, basically is a preference list. Those are our primaries. If we were to add or remove nodes from the cluster, the physical nodes that are responsible for those uh, slices of the key space, those V nodes, those physical nodes might change, but uh, the V nodes themselves are, will always uh, resolve uh, to the, you'll always resolve the same uh, V nodes with the consistent hash. So the same works for a CRDT. Okay. To follow up on that, then, so when, let's say you lose a physical node, mm -hmm. do you see a bunch of network traffic to redistribute the vNode information? So, in the event of a failure, uh, let's, let's call it a temporary failure, uh, because the node could potentially come back online. And, like, you could, you could, so you could kick it out of the cluster, and, uh, but, 
by doing so, it also takes all of the data that it has with it. So basically, you're going to have one over n missing replicas, where n is our replication factor. So you don't want to do that because most likely, you know, you could fix whatever's wrong. You know, like you know, maybe that just whatever is wrong. Okay. So in that event, any time now that you want to actually do a let's say a write operation where that node was supposed to be uh, responsible for one of the uh, slices of the key space that are involved in that operation, it's going to realize that that, uh, that node is not available. So it's then just going to pick the neighbor, uh, the next neighbor, if it were to conti continuously walk that ring. Uh, and it's just going to, that node, whoever owns that no uh, V node, that physical node is going to basically just spawn off a temporary or secondary uh, V node process that's responsible of, for being a container for all new incoming writes and serve as much traffic possible. When the uh, original node comes back online, there's going to be a background process of uh, handoff, uh, hinted handoff, where it's just going to give the data back uh, to the old node that it missed while it was down. Yeah. Did you have a redundancy in the nodes? Well, the replicas themselves are redundant. Right, but for that response, okay. Yeah. So do you, do you see a lot of, um, I, I guess there's more a question about actual limitation amongst maybe some clients, and people who are using React. Mm -hmm. Do you see the people who are saying, yes, we want to have nodes that are living here, over here on, let's say, Amazon's EC2, West Coast, uh, and then other people, and maybe some other nodes, or, or people like saying, oh, we want to co load KPs in the same. Uh... Great question. So, React needs to be deployed as a cluster on a LAN. Um, in the case of AWS, we all know what, you know, in, intra zone uh, latencies, uh, the, what they could look like at some times. And uh, you really don't want to create a cluster that spans uh, various regions simply because you might have a flapping effect where you try to do an operation, but it times out before it could uh, complete. So then they think that node's dead. It elects a fallback, but it's really online. So like you've got this handoff uh, process that's like continuously going, like, and it's really crazy. So you probably don't want to do that. So for high global availability, uh, Basho actually is a company that makes money. Uh, we love open source and since it had to be licensed, uh, but we do have an enterprise uh, license on top of the open source. And essentially the uh, main thing that qualifies uh, React Enterprise uh, against the open source is uh, functionality that will enable you to replicate uh, clusters uh, across data centers, across WANs. And you can choose subsets of your data that you want to replicate if you don't want to replicate at all. You can have it happening in real time or scheduled uh, full synchronization events, and it could be, you know, uh, active, 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 passive, any sort of global cluster topology that you can think of uh, that's possible. Uh, and even have like cascading, uh, cascading ranks where you go through other clusters and avoid other clusters. It's like really cool. Um, so if you if you want that functionality, uh, my, my guy uh, JP right here, I'll give you a good deal on a node. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but other than that, uh, Amazon. When you're on, I forget, you know, the class of instance types, but when they, when they give you, like, you know, good network or whatever, where they promise it's 10 uh, we do have customers that have uh, same region but different availability zone uh, mixed clusters. And that will sort of work, but it's not exactly some sort of guarantee of high availability, <laughs> simply because you don't have any sort of uh, knowledge of... Uh, each of the replicas that you're writing being distinct to multiple availability zones. So if you were to lose a whole zone, you might actually lose a whole chunk of uh, multiple replicas because you can't say this replica needs to go to, there's no rack awareness or anything like yeah. that. So you can't say replicas can't go to these different servers, you know? So, so there's no way to identify that to say, so even if you're running this in your data center, you could have AV tower or this that you want to split that data on, so there's no way to configure that? No. Uh, not yet, anyway. It's something that we have um, in our minds to introduce as a, uh, as a future. Uh, but to make it such that it's not as uh, difficult to run an operation, let's say, like HBase or Cassandra would be with those features, uh, it's going to take a little bit more work for us to figure it out so that you guys don't, you know, break things when you want to, you know, configure this thing. Uh, we, we're all about, like, the ease of operation, like, you know, Three lines on my terminal to build, uh, you know, fifty node cluster or whatever. Like, it's pretty awesome. Other questions? Yes. Um, what are the? Do you have like big uh, players using the technology right now? The biggest. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've got a few hundred paying customers, thousands of uh, open source deployments. Uh, there's a number. I might be 
estimates quoting it, so I'll give a range somewhere between 25 to 40 percent of the Fortune 50 is running React in various ways. Uh, there are some names that I can name and some names that I can't. Um, and if you want examples of those, let's talk at the bar later because I'm on video right now and I don't want to say a name that I'm not supposed to. <laughs> but like we've got like major financial companies, insurance companies, uh, uh, you know. Uh, Telcos. So, so I, I understand that might be confidential. So yeah. is, are they are this company trying to save money by not using Amazon or why is the competitive? Yeah, so um, I mean we do have paying customers that are actually using uh, deploying React onto AWS. Uh, Best Buy for instance. Uh, they run like one cluster on bare metal and then like two in AWS. And like when the Christmas uh, holiday shopping season starts to turn up in like Novemberish or whatever, they like spin up a whole bunch more instances in the AWS clusters to handle the additional traffic or whatnot. So I mean, you know, the profile of how React is going to behave on metal versus uh, something virtualized, we all know that. You know, it's like it's IO bound, then it's network bound, then it's CPU bound. You throw enough hardware at the problem, you can actually make uh, a cluster like uh, React uh, completely CPU bound. And like we've got some customers that are actually doing that, but the you asked, is it cheaper for them to be running React? And total cost of operations is a very difficult thing uh, to nail down, especially in a response to a Q&A session at a meetup. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, now let's talk about any NHS Yeah. All right, so uh, National Healthcare Service in UK is actually replacing uh, Oracle with React right now for vital patient records and you know things like that. Uh, that are an integral, uh, uh, critical piece of their infrastructure for total healthcare that's available in the UK because you know they they give people healthcare in the UK unlike this country. Um, so uh, one of the architects on that project actually basically said that uh, React actually saves like 2.5 babies a day or something like that. Like the cost savings that they're that they have from going from Oracle to React, and it's more than just the licensing issue. It's uh, it's also the amount of op staff that they require to actually maintain uh, that the uh, thing is, you know, still running and still available and still in operation. Uh, I've had people, you know, sending me emails and just tell me that, you know, they're running 20 node clusters or whatever, and two of their nodes happened to be down for two weeks and they didn't notice because it was still running and it was still online. So, like, that's basically what React gives you or tries to give you. Last question because it's running late. Yeah, that's a good question. How, how difficult would the migration? Uh, they're still doing it, so. <laughs> so um, migrating from a relational database to React is going to be tricky for some types of data and not so tricky for other types of data. And it's really thinking about your uh, data model once it's in React. You know, we've had we've got plenty of migration stories. Uh, you know, and um, let me think about this. So. Just a little bit of historical roots. React is modeled after uh, a system that was created by Amazon called Dynamo. And Dynamo was built when Amazon, before AWS, they were just selling books online. Uh, they had a series of a few very high profile uh, outages, uh, one notably in 2004 or 5 during the holiday shopping season. And, you know, Jeff Bezos descended from on high and, you know, he gave out an edict and it says, any any engineer and every, any ops uh, staff here that works at Amazon, if you put something into production that when it breaks, uh, when it eventually breaks, as we all know it's going to break, if it prevents people from giving us money, you're fired. So they came up with this uh, uh, this design, which a lot of the design principles uh, you'll see in React, uh, the consistent hashing and you know uh, and the siblings and uh, a lot of other things. Uh, they came up with this designed for a highly available distributed key value store. And essentially, they looked at all of their data that was in their relational databases up until this point, and they decided that like about 70% of that actually mapped to a key value model. So uh, they felt that was good enough. And then it just takes some clever thinking uh, for the rest of the 30%. And I think that would probably be very true for most people that are migrating from a non-key value store to something like React or if they're attempting. So uh, I'll be at the bar until until uh, so if you want if you want to chat with me more about CRDPs, special consistency, strong consistency, uh, you know consensus, computers, Ruby, uh, non Ruby languages, I'm more than happy to drink and talk with all of you. But thanks for listening.
download React. 